Welcome to Whispers of the Womb, the podcast that guides you on a journey of self-discovery and wellness. I'm your host, Suzanne Lawson, and today we're joined by Aneta, a trauma-informed somatic coach and senior yoga teacher from Kent. Aneta's holistic approach integrates various practices from yoga to mindfulness, aimed at helping you cultivate self-trust and confidence. Together, we'll explore the power of awareness and curiosity in fostering true well-being. This episode delves deep into the essence of health and self-discovery. So hi everyone and welcome to this Healing from Trauma Through Yoga, a conversation with Aneta and Suzanne. So I'm joined here today with Aneta, a trauma-informed somatic teacher and coach for women and I'm going to hand you over to her now and she's going to just explain a little bit more about her background and what it is that she offers now. So I'll hand you over. Hi Suzanne, thank you for inviting me. Um, so my background um comes from social care, working with trauma comes from social care. And um, when I was 18 years old, I moved to London. And um, you know, after a while of being there, I decided to start studying and I started studying um, counseling. I did some counseling trainings and some coaching and some NLP, that kind of stuff. And then I met somebody who was working as a manager in social care in a, in a day project for dual diagnosis, so mental health and substance misuse. And that's how I ended up working in social care. And I've worked in social care for 16 years, um, initially with individuals, yeah. um, working in a um, group program and supporting people one-to-one um, through their treatment and their ter- ter- therapy, and then worked in a crisis center in London in a very unique place, which was a residential crisis detox center for chaotic drug users. And then I worked, and then we moved out of London and came to Kent and I started doing more family work. Right. So working with whole families and then managing and supervising and training frontline workers in my teams who worked um, doing outreach with families and the uh, troubled families agenda and alongside of social services. So my my um, understanding of trauma and my experience of working with trauma really comes from this first hand experience of supporting yeah. um, people through quite challenging situations and and, and understanding how much <clears throat> of an impact there, there might be when somebody's experienced childhood, a lot of childhood trauma yeah. and the impact that, <clears throat> excuse me, it has on the on, rest of their lives. That's yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Like how it can transfer into everything that they do, I guess. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so I learned the biopsychosocial approach and a lot around running groups and a lot about different psychological and therapeutic approaches to supporting people, working with people one to one and in group settings. Um, and alongside of that, I was uh, very lucky that I. Um, came across yoga and mindfulness Um, and that was you know almost 30 years ago and I was very lucky again in London in uh, East London in Bethnal Green I was very lucky that I came across uh, a Buddhist community and yeah I loved it I loved it they had a Buddhist center they had a cafe they had the yoga studio <clears throat> and I learned yoga and alongside of that I also learned mindfulness mm. and loving kindness ah, and so there were there were kind of like a dual pathways for me on one hand I had a uh, this um love for yoga and mindfulness and on the other hand there was this very much psychological approach to uh working with people and yeah. one was much more body focused and much more holistic and the other one was very much focused on this um, top-down approach which is really you know psychological approaches but treated body as a completely separate thing thing yeah Mm -hmm. and so for me um you know I trained as a mindfulness yoga and meditation teacher 13 years ago and 
for me, I wanted always to bring those, those two, two together. together. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in my work, when I started working at my own yoga and uh, wellness studio, I um, alongside, I was doing that for quite a few years alongside of my full-time job in social care. I wanted to work much more holistically. I wanted to bring this top-down approach of really understanding what's happening and being uh, able to approach supporting somebody um, and guiding them through their journey, helping them in through that understanding of what's really happening for them through their values and uh, through their beliefs and um, through the clarity of their journey, yeah. but also bringing this top-down top uh, bottom up approach, approach. And, yeah yeah bringing the bringing body it. and yeah. bringing this um holistic approach yeah and, though, I and guess so those... that's what I do in in the way that I work and I guess people with trauma who have had very serious trauma will have not have even had any of this kind of nurturing or you know they the wouldn't have even probably connected with their body in the same way as some of us might have or yeah so that's like a really good way and obviously the teachings of the buddhists are, you know are so beautiful and it's a lovely approach to take for someone who is suffering from trauma, especially from childhood yeah. trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for somebody who has experienced trauma, the body, it becomes unsafe place. Yeah. And I think from my, because of my experience of working with trauma for, you know, close to 25 years in various settings, I think it's like, I'm very mindful of the language that I use. I'm very mindful of, um, the approach that I use yeah and this you know one of the most important things is to really meet somebody where they are at um not where where we are at or where we want them no, to be, to be but where actually, they are now yeah yeah to be able to meet them where they are at to actually have this sense of understanding and connection uh where you know when somebody feels seen and understood yeah, they can relax. They feel safe enough to yeah. continue exploring whatever is going on for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's brilliant. And one of the things, you know, if we talk about yoga, there are certain things. If we talk about language and yoga, there are certain things that I realized that I was using as well. Like we, you know, I've heard other teachers say that as well. Trust your body. And it's like, well, what does that, that mean? mean. <laughs> <laughs> and for somebody who's experienced trauma, th that the, might mean something completely different. That might different. be a real trigger. It, yeah, 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 completely. It's like, yeah. well, I don't know. I don't trust my body. I don't, no, you know, the because... same for somebody who lives with chronic conditions and experiences a lot of pain. It's like, well, I don't trust my body. I don't know what exactly that means, means. even. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah, thanks for mm -hmm. sharing that. Mm -hmm. when, when we first met, we discussed that kind of disconnect, if you like, between the NHS and holistic health. Um, so what examples have you come across of that recently? Can you give any examples to the listeners? Yeah, so <laughs> there are so many. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many. I mean, it's uh, one of the things that comes up a lot in the work that I do. And um, I work these days, I work a lot with women, especially women who are going through perimenopause and menopause, that transition time in day in their life is this um again and again I hear the stories about um not being listened to yeah and kind of being told certain things that um you know without really being told to do certain things without really being explained Yes. the consequences of those of choices decisions. and those decisions yeah. mm -hmm. and you know that comes with uh, hormonal support with HRT that comes with uh, operations um, and even if when I think about my own um, situation living with um you know, I have uterine fibroids and I've been to a number of doctors here in UK and in Poland as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ma majority of them were men. 
and saying things like, well, like, cut it all out. And that was the, the advice. If you're not going to have any children, you don't need it. So cut it all out. There was only one uh, doctor and I went to see her privately in Poland who said, no, it's OK. I respect your view. And that was a woman. I respect your opinion. <laughs> I respect your choice. And let's manage it in a different way. And if there are complications, obviously, you will need to consider it seriously. Yeah. And there is this kind of not understanding that, well, this is my body. I don't, you know, each woman um, needs to be able to make that decision, decision for herself. Themselves. Yeah. And to yeah. actually say, well, it's it's just a part of you, you don't need it, cut it out. And part of me was, you know, the second time I heard that, I was so angry. The first time I was shocked. I was like, yeah, okay, <gasps> really? And then the second, yeah. the second specialist said that, I was just like, well, actually... Part of me wanted to turn around and say, well, if I told you to cut off a <laughs> private part of you, well, how would you, you don't feel? need it because you're not going to have any children, uh, how would, how you, would you respond? Yeah, because yeah. uh -huh. it's it's different if um, a doctor would say to me, it, it's cancerous, it's, there is a direct risk yeah. to your health, mm -hmm. we really need to do something, it's urgent, you know, it can develop into something more, but you know, all the tests were showing everything is fine. It's just uncomfortable. It's just inconvenient. But they're saying... I still got my menstrual cycles. But, you know, the, there is a... It's not life-threatening Yeah. at this point. So we can monitor it. It's, it's this kind of... Saying, like, well, that will be it. If we do that, then that will be it. But actually, once you do your research... And you look into, well, if this happens, what happens? As with me, we all know that that's not the case. And actually, you could actually face a worse, worse scenario by yeah. cutting it all out. It's yeah. not just as straightforward and it's so complicated. Yeah, but that was not discussed. Yeah, that's I what knew I mean. that yeah, yeah. because yeah, I went that. off and yeah. did a research on but my own and I spoke with a number of friends and I did quite a yep. research on on internet to see what other people are saying but mm -hmm. that was not disclosed it was just like this is what we do we do let's you End know off. to the point that it was like this is what we do let's arrange an appointment in yeah the hospital. I was like no <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think you yeah. know but for me it's very interesting it's like I am you know, I am 50 year old, I've done a lot of training, I've done a lot of personal work, done a lot of therapy over the years, a lot of work around boundaries, you know, when you work in social care with highly vulnerable people, you have to yeah. develop very strong boundaries. I am happy to say no, I'm not doing it. Yeah, yeah. But... I'm also aware, you know, it's the same as in yoga class. If I go to a yoga class and they ask me to do some kind of pose, I'm very happy just to say, say no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. it. It's <laughs> yeah. not right for me. Yeah. And I don't feel embarrassed. I don't feel because I've done it a lot of time. It's familiar for me to set yeah. those boundaries. But I can imagine, and I've worked with clients, you know, I can imagine how difficult, and I know how difficult it is for some people in those kind of situations where there is a power dynamic and there yeah. is always within the medical setting power dynamic because they the expert and you don't know that much because you haven't studied it for years and haven't worked in that field mm -hmm. so what often what i think happens is that they just don't want to um they take it for granted and they just think i'm the expert i know what i'm talking about and they don't take into and there's account. not that like there's not that two-way conversation no, that, is there there's no. no it's just this is what we can do that's your choice yeah completely. yeah uh -huh. completely. but I know that you had some experiences yeah that yeah as well. so I mean I I mean I'm, I'm, when we met I mentioned about how I got sick. Uh, so I had a nephrectomy which was removal of the fallopian tubes and the ovaries um, so I went into radical menopause, but unfortunately, before I even got to that, I had to struggle with a battle. I got sepsis and I did nearly die with the sepsis. And then that turned into necrotizing fasciitis, which is flesh eating disease. Um, and actually, I was just saying to a friend earlier today, 
about how there were the, the, the disc going back to that disconnect. I remember when I was in the bed and the doctors came and said, can you describe your pain? And I said, yeah, it feels like something's eating me alive. And they all looked at each other as if to say, oh, it's a bit dramatic. However, they then took me down for a scan, came back, and I had necrotizing fasciitis, which translates as flesh-eating disease. Yeah. So the fact that they're asking me, can you describe your pain, and I'm describing it, and then they're kind of dismissing my comment, it's kind of a little bit of, there's a massive disconnect there between that sort of you know, if you're going to ask someone a question, listen to what they've got to say. Yeah. Yeah, completely. That sounds like a really full-on <laughs> intense experience and, and quite frightening and then yeah. not being listened to. Listened to, yeah. And I got, and it, it was, I, I can't even just, I mean, I've gone through, I've lived a life of pain myself for a lot of years. And I've never experienced pain like this. And, you know, when I was asked, what's your pain level, which always irritates me, that question, because everyone's different. And I've never, ever said a 10 for anything that I've ever had before. But this was a 10. And, you know, for someone else, it might have been a four or it might have been a five. But for me, it was a 10. Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's a scary, we... scary, scary thing, really, yeah, yeah. when you are in so much pain. And and so yeah. we, when we first met, and I mentioned to you about that surgery, obviously it was all around my stomach, um, which we just don't even realize actually. Which you know, in yoga, we talk about the core all the time, about you know, draw your belly in, the core, the core, the core. And actually, even as a yoga teacher myself. I really struggled with this um, when I was starting to recover. And my goal, one of my just overall goals was, was to be able to tie my own shoelaces. Um, it's worrying me, oh, what do other, how do other people cope, you know? So if you could think about like, your toolkit and what you tap into how do you think we can get that message across to other people about you know like how do we rely on ourselves rather than the medics rather than the drugs yes we do need medical professionals yes we do need drugs but for me that transition of I need to learn to walk again now I need to need to be able to put my shoes on how can we get that message across to other people about where they can go, what they can do to heal themselves, to take back that power? Mm, great question. I think I think it always has to start with taking time to pay attention. Yep. It's just, you know, we are all so busy. We are running around like headless chickens trying to squeeze everything, <laughs> everything trying in. to do yeah. everything and then you know it's it, a simple example of I've got a headache and, and we see that there is so much conditioning from media and from internet it's like you know all those adverts have a headache pop a pill, pop a pill. get on with it yeah you know feeling unwell have a flu or cold take this medication, get on with get it on so with you it. can come back and be more productive. Mm -hmm. And this this um, embracing this productivity and really the subconscious messaging and not sub subconscious, but a very kind of in your face that you only have value if you are productive. Yes. Shifts us into the doing and the productivity and action taking away from being. Yeah. So for me, the step number one is always, it always has got to start with awareness. And um, one of the qualities that we can really cultivate that, are, that, are, that is quite easy, it's like a doorway to the present moment, is the quality of curiosity. Rather than thinking, oh, this is what it is, this kind of uh, judgment level, you know, um, jumping straight into this kind of final understanding. It's really being curious 
-hmm. and thinking you know even with a headache it's like why do I have a headache maybe I haven't moved at all I've been at the computer all day (laughs) long maybe I haven't had lunch or breakfast maybe I didn't uh, drink any water maybe I'm just so stressed trying just, to work this out so hard. yeah mm-hmm. that it's like it's causing me a headache mm-hmm. and if we can start paying attention on a daily basis because if you think about uh, most things unless you've got an accident that is suddenly happened and there is a big change in how you are yeah most things developed over, mo- over weeks, months, and years. Mm-hmm. And if we can start paying attention, you know, we then notice, oh, something is different. Something is, you know, this this thing happens again and again and again. So, for example, um, I cut down my drinking over the years hugely. And... Over the last few years, I've been drinking maybe, you know, one or two drinks on a Friday, sometimes on Saturday, and that's it, not during the week. But that had real consequences on my well-being. And it's like I started to notice that I had a acid reflex afterwards. Right. And so one of the ways that I would cope is like get some, drink some bicarbonate so that and it's yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then I, you know, I started paying attention a little bit more and I noticed it's like, why do I want to have that alcohol on Friday? It's because I've been working and pushing through, still trying to push through during the week. So on Friday, I would feel quite wired. My mind yeah. would, wouldn't set, settle down. So I wanted something to, to kind just... of, yeah, yeah. Mm, to relax a little bit. But then because the of that... was that I wasn't sleeping properly because Mm -hmm. even that small amount of alcohol would impact my sleep. So on Saturday morning, I would wake up still really tired, if not more. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, the sugar overload from alcohol. Yeah. And just feeling really like "Mm, not okay and still really wanting to relax. Um, And so, and, you know, the acid reflux, I was like, oh, this is really strange. It's 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 really kind of, I'm not liking this. And so I stopped drinking. And actually, you know, next week, it will be one year that I've been alcohol free. And the things that happened, you know, over that last year, just this one thing that made such a huge difference, like my sleeping is much better. And if I don't sleep, well, I'm not exhausted the following day yeah. as I used to be. Uh, I don't have any acid reflux at all. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I, um, you know, I also started pacing myself much more through the work that I do. Like I have more breaks. Yeah, giving yourself, you know, instead of cramming like five things in on a day, saying like I'm going to do three. Completely. And then finishing early. Uh Yeah. Yeah. Finishing a little bit earlier, pacing myself. I sleep much better. I'm very early bird anyway. So waking up and, you know, finish starting early, finishing Finishing a little bit earlier. And I've had the most productive year in my business, but by not working more and longer hours, but actually but working less. Smarter. You know, and, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing in there was really, I stopped drinking because I'm in perimenopause, because it was impacting my health, not just acid reflux, but also my moods, even though I was not drinking that much. But it's also that disconnect, isn't it, as well, about like that's that's kind of society thinking, Right, it's the end of the week. Let's yes. have a glass of wine to relax. Yes. When actually, it's not actually. It's the same as like when people say to me, "I don't know how you find the time to do everything you do in your life," and I always come back with a question: How much TV do you watch on an evening? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> because I probably watch about an hour a night, if that sometimes. So if you're one of these people that come in from work, kick your shoes off, stick your up your dinner in the oven, put the telly on, and then that's it for the night, and then you go to bed. Yeah. So what seven, six hours TV from you know, yeah. 
like it's a no-brainer really that's why you don't have any time to do anything because yeah. you sit and watch on tv no i completely know you're not, know what you're you not mean. actually relaxing that isn't yeah. relaxing it's actually stimulating yeah. so it's, it's yeah i completely can relate well i'm limited to two hours maximum so yeah. it's it's it really gives you more time because otherwise you don't do stuff that you want uh, and as you said it's very stimulating it's those little things you know when you start noticing how how this one thing impacts everything else yeah yeah Mm -hmm. because it's like it's it's true you can do anything but you can't do it all the same time and ultimately you have to make a choice do I you know watch tv or do I read or do I drink alcohol or do I have fresh early mornings yeah yeah (laughs) you can't have both you can't have both no No. exactly especially as you get older (laughs) no definitely not and it's our body's way of saying you need to slow down that is what we're being told to do Um, so over the years how has your yoga practice changed from when you started because obviously you've been doing yoga quite a lot longer than me I was 37 when I started so how have you changed your yoga from like early on to now oh it's changed hugely yeah really hugely it's um so I Initially, I started, my teacher was Ayanga trained. Um, so I was with her for quite a long time. And then I found Ashtanga, my style. And I loved it because <laughs> it was just so physical and, and my body was great. I was really young. I was in my 20s and my body was really craving it. And it's like you could feel the workout. And, and because I was doing mindfulness as well and practicing mindfulness, it kind of complemented each other really well Mm -hmm. but at some point I was so I was going to my sort of style classes before going to work Um, and there was a little studio in Houston and my uh, at the time I was working at the crisis center that was in Eastlington in London so I could go to to the class and then go to work work. but um, I very quickly learned that it was not compatible it wasn't the best for me so I had this ashtanga is very fiery yes it it Mm -hmm. created a lot of heat and then I was going um straight after to work at the crisis detox center which was very stimulating and you never knew what you were walking into into. (laughs) (laughs) that could have been like drugs in the house and there is a complete lockdown and searching everything and everybody kicking off so everything was really you've been really high, heightened yeah, high level like yeah. like trauma trauma yourself like yes uh, completely fight or flight. And, yeah yeah very 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 um stimulating yeah and so this is why when I was working in the crisis center I I trained as a yoga teacher and I chose mindfulness yoga and meditation teacher training um because I realized that actually I needed to slow down a little bit uh the ashtanga was really great but I couldn't practice it on a daily basis like I was doing that Mm -hmm. I needed to kind of shift it into something else and so for quite a while then I slowed down and then I later trained in in yoga um I had a privilege of training with Sarah Powers and really slow down Mm -hmm. and um you know to this much more slower way Mm -hmm. um uh, a lot of yin practice and you know yin is sitting in mindfulness basically so it really worked so well and then it kind of shifted again when I uh started when I left um social care and I went fully self-employed about just under eight years ago it really started being much more fluid and so my practice these days and I trained in somatic movement and I also trained as a focusing practitioner so embodied listening practitioner working with felt senses and then there is a movement that comes within that yeah and so the practice that I do now is is very much led by what I need on the day on that day yeah. So I normally sit down or I lie down if I'm really tired and, you know, I roll out my mat, I plonk myself on my mat 
and then I check in it's like oh how do I feel and yeah. you know sometimes I start from lying down yeah and it's very soft it's very gentle somatic movement sometimes I do it by standing up and shaking and doing some yeah. warrior poses and yeah. maybe even some salutations and because I feel like that energy needs moving and I yeah. need that the strength spy, that through comes. the spine yeah. And, yeah yeah and so so it really depends and sometimes I just will lie down lie and do back. a little bit yeah. of very <laughs> gentle somatic stuff and um so it really really depends on the day um and but I see it how seasonally it changes as well yes yeah <laughs> like but isn't summertime it, you know isn't more it, movement mm. it's wonderful isn't it to have that knowledge um and that kind of intuition to know what your body needs yes you know to like what you, you know you identified quite early on that stranga just wasn't working for you because of other things in your life um and it is lovely to see that transition moving through and thinking well actually no i need to to do more of this and more of that yeah. and i think that kind of I have I do a couple of online classes a week, but I do find it a little bit of a struggle going to a class and then being told this is this is what we're doing. When I think, oh, my body doesn't want to do that; it wants to do this. <laughs> and, and it's a little, it's a little bit odd, isn't it? It's a little bit conflicting. Well, yes, yes, it can be, and at the same time, you know, the way that. Um, you know, that I do the trauma-informed yoga teacher training, the way that you can uh, teach the class, and this is the basis of trauma-informed work, mm -hmm. is to really give your clients an option. And that's 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 why the trauma-informed approach, somatic approach is so different. Like you could, I could, the way that I teach um, and I train others, it's I could instruct you to, give you um three variations of the same pose yeah three different intensity uh -huh. levels and ask you just to choose just to which choose one you want, to do. you want to do yeah. and if that mm. if that doesn't work for you do something different instead <laughs> yeah. so then you're yeah. in you're in body in that that you're embodying everybody to close their eyes and just connect with you completely yeah. giving completely. them that giving them that option that guidance if you like of this is what I invite you to do however right. what's going on in your body are you feeling it in your hips are you feeling it in your back where are you feeling it is that hurting a knee or let's yeah. try and this it, it yeah. is also about curiosity it's yeah. like, you know, because often we don't know, we think that we feel on a certain level and this is what's possible for us. And But once we actually connect within, different things come, things up. come out. So yeah. I've been with people in the past where they, you know, that was quite a while ago, quite a few years, you know, we were doing, we were playing with arm balances and the headstands. And I, I remember one client saying, well, no, I can't do that. I was like, that's fine. I'm not asking you to do all of it. I'm asking you just to lean into it. And up she went <laughs> because there was no expectation. And I think it's like, if we bring that curiosity, if we allow people just to play with it, if one of the things that I say again and again and again, it's like, listen within to what's happening within your body. Pay attention yep. to the feedback from your body, not your mind, but your body. Your body. Yep. And don't worry about what everybody else is doing. We all have different bodies. You know, there is no competition. Mm -hmm. You're not expected all to do the same. Yeah, we're not a cult <laughs> that you are expected to wear the same clothes and do the same movement and speak exactly the same way. We are here to explore and connect with it in mm -hmm. any way that feels right. You know, so yeah. noticing what do you need most the, the most from today's practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, I talk about whatever I talk, that kind of psychoeducation stuff. Uh, within the session but you yeah. take whatever you need to and you make it your own yeah mm -hmm. that's good advice I like that yeah. 
And so you offer this um, 80 hour trauma certificate program for qualified yoga teachers. Um, right. So what does that involve and how can listeners find out more about that? Sure. So um, I've been running this training for three and a half years now. And I think mm -hmm. we are, you know, we've had 10 or 11 cohorts and it's grown. It used to be 50 hour. Now it's 80 hour because there is so much material. So we, you know, the, within the training, there are 12 sessions mm -hmm. and each one focuses on something slightly different. So there is the trauma education and trauma informed approach education, really understanding the nervous system. We do assessments, how to see what somebody's presenting with. We look at uh, the pillars of five pillars of trauma informed approach and how we can bring it into our work how we can make postures and asana yoga asana more trauma informed the breath work more trauma informed meditation and mindfulness so we talk a lot about the language yeah, um like well, what you were talking about earlier. yeah yeah very very important part and we also cover different um embodiment practices so that that come more from this um somatic and embodied approach so we look at the four seasons model and four elements and how to bring it into the kind of teaching that we are doing and one of the most beautiful things around this training is that my intention for training and mentoring other teachers is that they develop their own unique style yeah so it's not like nice. you know when people come and train as a yin yoga teacher trainer or ashtanga where they follow a specific thing and they train in it and that's how they teach yeah i invite people to come in from whatever lineage they are mm -hmm. however they've been trained and then adding the information and so the like knowledge a, and the practices like a, into whatever they are doing uh, already like it complements what they do and it like enhances their that's right yeah that's their right. knowledge yeah because I think sometimes people think like, oh, I don't, I don't work with uh, populations or clients who are really, who experience lots of trauma like you did. And people say that to me sometimes. It's like, oh, you work with, you know, di dual diagnosis, mental health, substance misuse. I, I don't do that. I don't have intention of doing it. And I think it comes from this misunderstanding that actually trauma yeah, is everything, people, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's maybe it's not everything, but it's like people think about trauma and this um, small minority within our society, you know, PTSD and CTPSD, which is like uh, f three, three and a half percent of the population. But what we, what I want to expand it to is the traumatic events, which is like over 90% of population that have experienced it, that is yeah. still showing up in their physiology, in their identity, in the choices that they're making, mm -hmm. in the lifestyle that they have. And I think it's, you know, after the pandemic and after everything else, we all really need to understand it. And I don't believe somebody said to me the other day, it's like, oh, in pandemic, we all been traumatized. And I don't, I disagree with that. It's like, no, we don't, we haven't all been traumatized because the thing about trauma is that it's very personal and very individual. And you take even two identical twins and they both respond to the D same event differently. differently. Yeah. So yes, all of us, I'm sure all of us were scared and freaked out on some level, but doesn't necessarily that it was, you know, re-traumatizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for some people, it was re-traumatizing because they already have experienced a lot of trauma and that was just yet another thing on top of top everything of else. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. So really, you know, what I'm trying to say is that the training is open to all qualified yoga teachers. And I've had teachers that only just finished their uh, yoga teacher training. And I had teachers that have been doing it for 20, 30 years. So it's and, a good mix of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think ultimately it's one of those courses that you come in and that there is a lot of personal insights about yourself, what works for you. And then there is a lot of um, 
you know, personal growth and healing that comes within that when you start seeing those patterns and you start, you know, seeing systems. We talk a lot about systems thinking and working with systems and how it's all linked up and how, and you start seeing it's like just by making this one change, the whole system shifts Shifts. and really spotting that and working in that perspective from the, you know, when you're working with clients and supporting Mm -hmm. them. That's excellent. Thanks for that. Um, So I'll just give you a little brief overview of my online coaching program. Um, So for those of you who don't know about my history, I've suffered from endometriosis for many years. um, And I went on to this holistic path when I was in my 20s. Um, I started off with um, reflexology and Reiki, actually became a reflexologist. I became a Reiki master because I was so amazed at the power of both of those modalities. Having had them as a practitioner for many years before I studied crystal therapy, and then I went on to become a yoga teacher And so my coaching program, Wellness to Womb, is a six-month one-to-one support with me. Um, It's six months because I do believe that, you know, in those six months, a woman might only actually have four periods in that time. You might only have, like, four bleeds in that time. And I think it can take, like what we were saying before, to shift someone's um, beliefs, someone's rituals. And, you know, it takes a a bit of getting used to to change and look at holistic wellness for that. Um, So I go through this. I've got this proven method of seven pillars, um, which is to align the body and the brain and beyond. And I've used this method myself over and over and over again. Every time I've hit a, a problem in my life, just recently, obviously, with the sepsis. So that's everything about my program. So is there anything else that you would want to say at this point, Anetta? Um, No, just thank you so much uh, for having me here. And if anybody wants to find out anything about my my programs uh, under the Golden Mandala Yoga Soma Institute, the Trauma-Informed Somatic Coaching and the Trauma-Informed Yoga, you can find it really easily uh, by pop all the links. my name yeah <laughs> I'll pop all the links in right. the bottom of the video as well right. so that everyone's got connections with us it'd be great to... and I also wanted to say thank you it's such an important thing that we keep having those conversations yeah uh, that we start you know that we have honest conversations about how to make yoga accessible yeah. you know beyond the young and fit and flexible to actually populations that really need it, that might not necessarily be, you know, high risk populations, but actually making it accessible for a whole range of women and men yeah. coming into our classes and, and feel welcome and um, supported in a, in a right kind of way. And allowing them to take control over whatever's going on in their lives to be yeah. able to just grow older a little bit more calmly yes we all need a bit more calm definitely (laughs) so thank you so much for joining us today it's been a wonderful conversation so thank you everyone for tuning in to healing from trauma through yoga a conversation with anetta and suzanne so namaste thank you So before we conclude, I'd just like to revisit my truly special transformative six-month program for women known as Wellness to Womb. This personalized one-to-one program offers unwavering support to navigate the intricate landscapes of gynecological pain, hormonal health and mental well-being. It's a profound journey towards holistic wellness that has the potential to profoundly transform your life. So thank you again for joining us on this enlightening episode of Whispers of the Womb. We hope that today's conversation with Annetta has ignited a sense of curiosity within you, encouraging you to delve deeper into the whispers of your own body and mind. 
As we wrap up this episode, remember that the voyage of self-discovery and wellness is a continual one. It, it involves embracing the power of awareness, nurturing curiosity, and taking those gradual steps towards a more harmonious and fulfilling life. We invite you to delve further into Aneta's teachings and the profound wisdom shared here. If you found value in today's episode, please consider sharing it with friends and family who may find solace and insight in these conversations. Once again, we express our gratitude for being a part of the Whispers of the Womb community. We eagerly await your return for our next profound expedition into the essence of health and wellness. Until then, take good care, stay curious and be well.